Um, Moon Over Monona Terrace is sponsored by a grant from the Aligned Energy Foundation and in partnership with the Madison Astronomical Society and UW Space Place. And with that, I'm handing it over to Martin and again, Jeff Shockler. Hi, everybody. And um, I'll probably kick off if that's okay with Jeff. And Jeff, well, anytime you want to pitch in here. Um, what I thought I'd do is just introduce a little bit. Um, I, I don't I don't want to show you the weather picture because it is so frustratingly close how <laughs> near the clear skies are. It's about 15 miles west. Oh. And uh, today I really thought it was going to clear up. In fact, I saw the moon at four o'clock. And then since then, it's just built up. I think it knew that I was setting up a telescope. <laughs> but um, but this is uh, my home observatory. I have a, a quite a large telescope here by amateur standards. It's a Celestron 14-inch telescope. It uh, has a little guide scope on the side. And I thought I'd just walk around here and show you the business end because on here I have a, a video camera attached, which is this red thing here, and then a filter wheel, and then a uh, what's called a Barlow lens, which actually multiplies or magnifies uh, two times more than the telescope already magnifies. So that's the setup I use for planetary imaging. And what planetary imaging does is um, it records video frames at a very fast frame rate. Um, you saw the images, the wonderful video that Jeff had of the moon, and you saw the shimmering of the moon's surface caused by the Earth's atmosphere. And what high-speed video can do is capture still frames of all of that motion, and I'll show you those in a moment, and some very advanced software, uh, which is freely available, remarkably, uh, can actually select all of the clear, crisp frames of the images of the planets, stack those, just those together, and then sharpen them. And it's really, it's called lucky imaging because it really is lucky in how it goes ahead. So what I'm gonna do first is show you an initial uh, video frame of Jupiter. Um, and also, um, you know, anytime, uh, again, Jeff, if you want to pitch in here, that's just fine. But I'll, uh, here's a video frame of Jupiter taken in a red filter. This was back in uh, September the 13th through this telescope. And I don't know how well the video will come across on, um, on the uh, video, uh, on the internet feed here, but hopefully you can see that there are two broad dark bands here. Uh, these are the equatorial belts of Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is a planet that is uh, 12 times or 10 to 12 times the diameter of the Earth. So it's a huge planet. <clears throat> and you may be able to see just occasionally as our Earth's atmosphere wanders across this uh, planet uh, that this northern belt here is actually split into two. And there's a little dark feature here. And you may not be able to see very much here, but there's a, there's a feature right here that I'm going to show you through a different color filter. So, so that's the red filter. So check out the same uh, image sequence, but through a blue filter, and we'll see the dramatic difference that this takes. So now I'll play this one. And look, that light area is now completely dark. And it's dark in the blue filter, and it's bright in the red filter. So you might guess what that object is. It is the great red spot on Jupiter. And this is a remarkable feature that's two to three times the size of our planet Earth uh, in, it, in its, uh, in its uh, width. And it goes around Jupiter uh, along with these cloud belts. So it's a pretty amazing uh, thing. And what you're seeing here is some of the video stacking software that I use. And you notice the frame is shifting because it was actually moving in the telescope. Uh, and what this software does is it, it centers Jupiter on every frame. And, um, and what I can do uh, next is just uh, go and share 
the still image of Jupiter. Uh, this is a black and white image, by the way, uh, a still image of Jupiter, uh, which is uh, from that video frame. So you see the great red spot and dark and blue. You see these belt features. And uh, if you go ahead and um, stack some of those images into color frames, uh, you can really see some remarkable detail. So what I, would, what I thought I would do is just bring up, um, oh, four images of Jupiter, and then maybe, uh, Jeff, you can chime in and, and, and chat about some of these. Let me just sure, find them. Um, there we go. So I will... Uh, I brought my images up. I'll just share my entire screen because that's the easiest way to show all those uh, images, actually. So uh, there we go. Can you Excellent. see those, Jeff? Yeah, they look great. Great. So everyone, you know, think about what the raw data, the images that Martin was acquiring through the video camera, remember what those look like? They kind of look like an amoeba to me, right? They didn't look like Jupiter. They look like some strange moving spherical object that maybe had a little bit of detail in it. And that's where the power of taking video comes and shooting images of the moon sometimes, but also in planetary imaging is that literally, I don't know how long you, how many frames you shoot, but when I'm doing planetary, I'll typically shoot of Jupiter nine or 10,000 frames using video. That's right. And then I'll have the software pull out the best 400 of those, the sharpest, cleanest, best focused, yeah. where the yeah. atmosphere was stable for a split second, but I was, but I captured that moment. And then you take those 400 and you add all that signal together and you work that over a little bit. And this is what you get. You get an image of Jupiter that's beautiful and has lots of structure. And we'll talk about some of the things that you can see here, but you get that result from what looks like an absolute mess. <laughs> so it's a fascinating process. It's almost like magic that we can acquire mm -hmm. all of this, all of this data, all of these frames, have software kind of pick out the best ones, add the remaining signal together and get a result like this. So Jeff, you're probably like me in that, um, you know, you grew up in the 70s and 80s uh, with yes. a small telescope and exactly. viewing Jupiter through a telescope and trying to take photographs and they were all blurry. And in fact, all professional photographs of Jupiter were blurry as yes. well. Uh, they could do no better. And now amateur, telos amateur astronomers in their backyard with modern uh, video cameras uh, which honestly, the cameras don't cost a fortune. Um, yes, the telescopes are expensive or can be, uh, but the cameras are, um, you know, a few hundred dollars and free software. And you uh, do far better imaging than any professional planetary imager from the 1990s back. <laughs> absolutely absolutely and that's true too for images of uh, galaxies and nebula and things like that that's the only right. thing that really um, has taken the professional game to a completely new level one of the things is having space-based observatories like the hubble and things like that but it's remarkable what we can do uh, from the ground now with with amateur equipment and looking at at martin's beautiful images of jupiter particularly i want to show um uh, the one on the right uh that has mm -hmm. the great red spot uh down there in the lower right corner a couple of things about what you're seeing here let me see if i can remember how to um annotate uh let me see do 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 gotta find that and if you go. can't do it, I can try and then follow. Yeah, I think I can. I've got, uh, I, I was able to uh, remember where that was. So I'm going to put an X mark on a couple of interesting features. Um, Martin mentioned the equatorial bands. So what these are, are like our, uh, here on Earth, our jet streams. So think about the jet stream on Earth that drives a lot of our weather, and that's currently driving us a little bit crazy because it's not doing its work in moving those clouds off of Martin uh, down in Kansas. But the jet streams on Earth at, at their fastest get to be up around 200, 220 miles per hour. The jet streams, uh, these jet streams that are, that are represented by these equatorial bands, those can go up to five or 600 miles an hour. So Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system 
um, but it also rotates the fastest. That thing, which is uh, 80,000 miles in diameter, rotates at 10, in 10 hours. So a Jupiter day is 10 hours long. So there are really, really dynamic atmospheric forces um, going on on that planet. And it creates this incredible set of banding uh, across the, the face of the planet. And all of those kind of swirls and circles that you see, including the great red spot itself here, but even these, those are actually storms. Uh, think of hurricanes uh, on the face of the planet. Other things you want to point out, Martin, in your wonderful shots? Uh... Yeah, sure. I can uh, point out a couple, and I'm glad you brought up the annotate because that's mm, yeah. uh, really <laughs> fantastic. And I'm not very good at drawing, but uh, what I'll do is I'll use I like the a... stamp feature. Yeah, I'll use this. Let's try that. Um, so I'll use a little circle. So on the left-hand picture, you'll see that there's a very, very black uh, dark spot. Uh, really quite unusual. And that's actually the shadow of one of the four moons of Jupiter that were originally discovered by Galileo back in 1610 uh, with the very first telescope uh, pointed to the sky. Galileo was the first one to use the telescope and actually record and published his results. So he, he's the one who got known about it uh, or uh, uh, wrote down all his results. So that's actually a shadow, and, and this uh, dark shadow just moves over five or ten minutes. Um, it'll cross, uh, this one will probably cross all of Jupiter in the, about uh, two hours, maybe less. Um, and other moons do that as well. So these are particularly fascinating to follow. Um, and then uh, the other thing I mentioned about the video frames that I showed you, was that part of the belts in this South Equatorial belt are actually split in two. Uh, and then you see the great red spot is right here in the corner. Um, and then it's over here on this shot. And you see uh, this region where the belts are split in two. So you're actually seeing almost the, uh, the entire uh, planet here on two sides of it at any rate. And, and as uh, Jeff mentioned, Observing Jupiter and seeing Jupiter uh, either through a telescope directly or with the video, as, as I have done in the, uh, many cases, um, the features are moving relatively quickly. Uh, the entire uh, face of Jupiter changes, and you can see the motion, or you can see objects are shifting in your uh, video over uh, five to 10 minutes. Uh, it's pretty dramatic. Martin, we have a great question here that I'd love you could answer because you shared the story with me before uh, we went live. So Bonnie has a question. If the, if those are storms, does that mean the photos will look different every day? Do you want to oh. talk about that new storm that just popped up and you're, you're yes. kind of part of that story? And in fact, yeah, that would be great. That's a great story to share. And I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, and I'll, I'll try and go and search for the pictures while, uh, while I'm sharing my screen here. Um, but uh, yes, so Jupiter changes every, um, every few minutes, every day. And sometimes really uh, interesting storms can pop up. And um, yeah, I'm going to be hard pushed to actually find, uh, find it, but I'm going to try. <laughs> Um, so uh, one of the storms that popped up was uh, in this north uh, equatorial, just north of the equatorial belt, a very bright spot appeared. And it was discovered by a Japanese um, amateur astronomer who was observing. I'm just going to bring up some other images here and see if I can see it. Um, and uh, he was observing, uh, I believe it was the 18th of August. So I'm wondering if some of these pictures have it. Um, and uh, he announced his, uh, uh, you know, this discovery of this bright white spot. And when I read about it, I thought, wait a minute, I was observing that previous night. And so I went back to my files and I believe 
I have them in a different folder, so, um, but let me uh, just see if I can find it. This is a really good image, uh, one of my better ones. Um, I, I, when I go back to some of these images, I almost have to pinch myself to say, wow, I actually took that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's remarkable how some of these images. Anyway, I went back to my earlier image and I found that I'd actually photographed this thing 12 hours earlier the discovery, which is one rotation, or 10 hours earlier, I'd, I'd got the exact uh, moment of when this um, uh, white spot appeared. And I think this may be it, actually, uh, one of the images. You see that little bright whitening there? Most of the time, you would not recognize it as anything particularly uh, unique, and that's not a very clear photo. Um, and so I ended up with uh, what's called a pre-discovery image uh, of this uh, white spot. Um, here, actually, I think is an image. So this is uh, interesting to compare because I have the other photo of, here's a picture of Jupiter on the 5th of September, and here's the picture on the 20th of September. And uh, what you see is there are some dark clouds at the top here. And you see 15 days later, they've really changed relative position. And I think this white spot here is that storm system because what it generated were these black dark clouds in the wake of this storm. So, uh, and you see down here, the two parallel belts are pretty much the same, but they started breaking up as well. Uh, and then this dark feature was this one, and this swirl here was this one. Mm -hmm. And so, and the relative position of this dark feature uh, here, and I should use annotate. Uh, let me go back to annotate. So you see the white spot here and this dark feature. And here, the white spot is over here, and the dark feature is here. They've actually changed in relative position to each other because the wind speed, Jupiter doesn't rotate as a solid object. Uh, the equatorial belt actually rotates faster than the northern part by five minutes difference. And that creates this enormous shear in the winds upwards of a thousand miles an hour or so. Um, which creates some of this turbulence. So, so that's a good comparison there. There are not many astronomical um, objects that are, are dynamic when you're just looking at them by eye or you're imaging or photographing them. Comets are, and we all got to enjoy a really remarkable comet in the Northern Hemisphere recently um, that was, was amazing and it changed you know, day to day and certainly over the span of weeks. Jupiter is one object that um, because of its fast rotation, because it's a gas ball and those gases are moving and changing and shifting, um, it's very dynamic. It's fascinating to watch it over time. Another thing that amateur astronomers do is that we're observing in video uh, recording Jupiter all the time. As amateur astronomers all over the world, if it's dark and Jupiter's up, we're doing that. We're often the ones who first see impacts on Jupiter in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Um, now, occasionally there's a big comet uh, like the one that uh, Shoemaker-Levy, I think it was, that slammed into Jupiter uh, back in the 90s. Uh, the professionals were on that. They all observed that, that chain of impacts. But it, it's very common for amateur astronomers to see an impact event, which usually produces a bruise, a little dark scar on, 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 on Jupiter, in Jupiter's atmosphere. Uh, we see it first, we report it to an international uh, body that uh, where one can report such things. And then all the professional instruments, uh, including uh, orbiting observatories, point at Jupiter to see what they can learn about uh, the interior, essentially the subsurface, the, the deeper atmosphere of Jupiter from what comes out of that impact, the ejecta and things like that. So amateurs can play a major role in science by observing these very dynamic bodies all the time and catching these, these events that otherwise would actually go unnoticed because professionals are not always looking at the planets in the same way that we are kind of constantly trying to capture this video uh, to make beautiful images and images also of scientific value. 
there's another uh, great story I mean, you just reminded me, Jeff, um, is that there's a friend of mine in South Africa who uh, is a really, a really good uh, imager of Jupiter. And uh, I can't find, uh, well, this is a reasonably good image to use as an example. So um, in uh, uh, his name's uh, Clyde Foster, and he's uh, been helping me a little bit in, in understanding how to do the correct uh, processing. Uh, everybody in astronomy is very good at sharing and helping each other. Uh, if you look at this um, image here in the middle, and uh, you see the great red spot right here, what Clyde was doing was imaging this region, and he noticed in this region just next to the red spot, there was a brilliant white spot in, uh, in the um, ultraviolet he had a special ultraviolet filter. And he's part of a program that monitored Jupiter in the few days before the NASA spacecraft Juno flies over uh, that region. And this very bright spot occurred and he was the discoverer of it. And Juno was flying over that region two days later. So Clyde, an amateur astronomer, ended up collaborating with NASA controllers uh, directly for two days, planning the imaging of this spot. And I encourage everybody to go and check out mm. Clyde's spot on Jupiter. Uh, NASA <laughs> did a, a press release on the whole discovery, and the spacecraft was able to capture a really high-resolution image. And what it was was an upwelling storm uh, that was very rare. So amateurs really can contribute uh, to this. That's a great story, Martin. Thanks for sharing that. Um, do you want to go to Mars? Sure, yeah, we can show Mars a little bit. Um, some of you who may be wondering, it's like, what is that bright orange-red light in the night sky right now, particularly high uh, and very, very bright? That's Mars. Mars just passed its closest approach uh, to us uh, this year. It's called opposition when Mars and Earth are as close as they get in their respective orbits. And that happens once a year. This ha year happened to be a particularly good and particularly close one uh, due to the orbital dynamics. So amateur astronomers all over the world have been busily imaging when it's clear, uh, imaging Mars and getting phenomenal shots. Uh, and also looking at Mars through, the t through telescopes um, because you can actually discern some really nice surface features uh, when Mars is this close, including like the South Polar Ice Cap, um, the Valles Marineris, which is this giant valley on Mars, Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system is on Mars, um, all sorts of interesting features. And here we have Mars kind of, but you're now familiar, right, with the atmospheric effects, right, of, in this video. So this is Mars uh, with all the atmosphere doing its thing uh, to the image. Go ahead, Martin. So this, um, I captured two minutes uh, of video uh, at about 150 frames a second. Um, every now and then you can see the South Pole, the South Polar Cap is a dark region, a bright region up here. Um, this uh, Y-shaped feature here is a well-known feature on Mars uh, called Certus Major. Uh, and this uh, little arm here is another well-known feature called uh, sinus meridiani. Uh, actually, this uh, end here is the zero point of longitude on Mars. And then this uh, br uh, bright feature here, it's not that bright, but often it's a lot brighter, uh, is uh, called the Hellas Basin. It's a large basin that is usually filled with dust. Um, all of these bright regions on Mars are very dusty. And the darker regions show where the dust has been blown clear of the rock. And so you just have um, that uh, creates the darker features. And so this is um, <clears throat> a uh, two minute video. Uh, you notice up here, it's actually 27,000 frames of video. And I would probably uh, stack about 1,500 of these frames. Uh, only. So that's about 5%, <clears throat> because as you see, not very many of them are clear. And uh, I see we're getting near time, so I'm going to stop share and then just go and bring up um, my Mars images. So, so sure. I'll just share the main screen.
And I have uh, a few of them uh, to oh, show beautiful, here. Martin. Um, and one of them is annotated, which I know I'm, you will uh, like. Excellent. I love annotation. So let me uh, put that one here. Maybe you want to, if you sure, want to go um, ahead on this. Yeah, just a, a, <laughs> a few of the beautiful things. So again, the, the, um, the atmospheric effect that's seeing, and when you have turbulence, doesn't just impact um, imaging or photography of these kinds of objects, it actually affects your view at the eyepiece. So when I'm looking through my telescope visually using an eyepiece and I'm looking at Mars, if there's a lot of turbulence, it looks a lot like um, Martin's video. It's just not very pleasing. It's kind of muddy and you don't see a lot of detail, but you have moments of clarity where all of a sudden the atmosphere is calm for a split second and you get this moment where it looks a little bit like what Martin's wonderful photographs look like. Um, but the value of, of doing imaging uh, is being able to capture many of those moments and then kind of add that signal together to get unbelievable images like what we have here from Martin. Um, the South Polar Cap about two months ago was much bigger, uh, much brighter, easier to see. It, it's been shrinking. Um, as uh, that part of Mars moves towards summer. Uh, it just diminishes, um, but it's very visible in uh, amateur telescopes, even modest sized telescopes. Uh, but these are beautiful images of Mars from our current op um, opposition, uh, Martin. I don't see any other questions at the moment in the uh, Q&A. We only have a minute or two left if anyone has a final question. Otherwise, we'll, uh, I want to thank Martin so much. Ma Martin is not a member of the Madison Astronomical Society. <laughs> we may have to make him an honorary member. He's just a really nice person. He volunteered to, to try and help us out uh, tonight with a remote telescope uh, location. But really want to thank you, Martin, for all you've done tonight, uh, for working with us. And uh, hopefully, we can uh, connect again soon. Sure, it's been my pleasure, and thank you very much for having me along. Thanks, Martin. Misty, I think we'll turn it back over to you. We've got some thanks coming in. Uh, I was going to say, if you want to take one or two questions. Sure, it looks like too. we have, why is the South Pole at the north of the screen? So <laughs> if you think about optics, um, the number of surfaces that light goes through or reflects off of actually inverts or reverses uh, the, the light. Um, so what you're seeing, the South Pole is at the north of the screen. It's an inverted image um, because of the optical system, the number of either lenses and lens surfaces that the light's passing through in uh, Martin's setup or mirrors that the light is bouncing off of in his setup because he has a telescope that actually has both. And then also there might be a filter that the light is passing through. It all gets very complex. So. Uh, it's rare actually when you're looking through a telescope or imaging through a telescope where you're seeing the object in its right and proper orientation in the sky. It's usually either upside down or reversed or both upside down and reversed, which can be kind of maddening. <laughs> Good question though, thank you for that. And I might, I might add also, Jeff, I, I submit my photo, uh, my images to the British Astronomical Association, mm -hmm. and they've been observing Mars since uh, 1892. Wow. And all of their records show the telescopic view with south at the top. And oh, so they, they maintain that uh, consistency. Mm -hmm. Now with Jupiter, because they're working with NASA, NASA like north at the top, and so we have to supply our Jupiter images um, flipped over with north at the top. So of course, of course, <laughs> and those are all conventions, right? What's north really mean? It's just our way of orienting things it's, so that we can yes. kind of have frames of reference. So yeah. really good question. Thanks for that.